you're talking about here? Section 127 is an employer assistance plan. Okay. It's the uh, ability of an employer to, pro to provide up to, I think, $5,250 to an employee uh, towards their education expenses. Uh, why do employers do this? Actually, uh, perhaps a good example is a, um, maybe the owner of a subway shop or, or some similar business that employs young people. Yes. It's a great benefit for the young person, and for the company, it's a benefit they can offer to keep that younger person working for them. So they're not continually rehiring and retraining and, and you know, going through all that expense. Okay. That, that goes away um, unless it's, unless it's uh, renewed. Oh boy. Now, um, related to this, for uh, if an employee is getting additional education really that relates to their employment and the employer uh, may require that as a condition of their employment, uh, sort of continuing education, uh, those types of expenses when an employer pays it, there's no problem. Right. I mean, basically that, that's a tax deduction for the employer. And, uh, and that, by the way, that's the ideal way to structure that because if the employee pays for those expenses and claims a miscellaneous itemized deduction, they may not get a tax benefit. For example, it's not deductible for alternative minimum tax. So, um, Yes, those things are uh, more difficult, yeah. you know, yeah. not, not necessarily as helpful. Anyway, but uh, that doesn't relate so much to the young person that's getting into university. It's more for maybe mom or dad at work. All right, uh, so how about, um, okay, so you're asking here the, the, the question, what about the tax preparation programs, and I guess <laughs> they're all going to need to be updated, and, and also the, the uh, tax planning. Tax, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, so, so, so we don't know whether these things are going to be there, and so it's hard for us to plug them into, you know, tax planning uh, software or something if, if, uh, if it's not even available according to the laws it is right now. There are, there are some, um, some things you can do. There is some tax planning you can do um, with regard to education, though. Um, so this year, for example, the, the Roth IRA has been a big issue, as you yes. know, with the ability to com com convert money uh, from a regular IRA into a Roth IRA and pay the taxes. Yes. Uh, this, this, you know, this has an aspect for education. If you are the parent of a high school junior, um, so you'll be going to college in 2012, mm -hmm. there's the opportunity here to make that Roth conversion. And when you make a Roth conversion that's generally accepted, the best way to do this is to pay the taxes which are due from money which is not in the IRA, from, mm -hmm. from taxable money. Right. Um, if you do that as a parent of a junior, uh, what you're doing is taking money out of your, the, the taxable yeah. uh, account, uh, and, and that is money that would be assessed for financial aid. Mm -hmm. So if you can benefit from financial aid, qualify for financial aid, getting that money spent, paying that tax bill, is actually a good thing. Hmm. You can, um, and because you're a parent of a junior, between now and the end of this year, it's only another month, basically, um, you're gonna be doing it in a year that won't be, part, won't be considered for financial aid. Okay. So if you're the parent of a senior, it's already too late, unfortunately. So. In other words, I think what you're saying is that you're better off uh, if you're in that position with a junior student front-loading the Roth um, income instead of trying to defer it into the two later years. Yes. Okay. Yes, that would be an aspect of that. So uh, how about some other tax-saving opportunities for 2010? Well, if the American Opportunity Credit is going away, make sure if you have a, a student in college now that you use it. Mm -hmm. um, to use it, you have to pay at least 4000 To use it fully, you have to pay $4,000 of the tuition expenses uh, from your own money. If you didn't do that, um, then prepay spring. Pre prepay the tuition from the, the spring semester. Uh, just make sure you grab that credit. Okay. You can go and see your, your tax accountant to, uh, to make sure you do. Now, you need to watch this. I set, had a, a situation with one of my clients where um, where 
money was coming from an inopportune place for this American Opportunities Credit. There was a, a, a trust that had been set up by Grandma and Grandpa that was being used uh, to pay for some education expenses. And it, basically I said, we got too much of it coming from here. It's, you know, it's messing up your credit. And so uh, uh, I think it's, that's something to look at, too, mm -hmm. or to be aware of. Okay, now, uh, what there's, if... There's, well, there's one other, okay. one other tax tip I, I, I like to mention. Okay. Um, you know, I see a lot of families who have losses in their 529 plan. Okay. Uh, sometimes sizable losses. So, in other words, you set up this education savings account. Uh, there's no tax deduction when you set it in, but the idea is that you're going to get a, a tax avoidance uh, if it, in fact, goes up in value. Mm -hmm. But now things didn't go as planned. Now it's gone down in value. <laughs> now what do you do? Now what do you do? Uh, it is possible to take a deduction for those losses, but it's not a capital deduction uh, on Schedule D like you know, most people are used to taking for their regular taxable accounts. It can be taken, but it's on Schedule A under miscellaneous expenses. And that means it's subject to that 2% haircut, right. <laughs> unfortunately. It may not make sense then for everybody, um, uh, you know, depending on what that 2% is, what that limit is. You also have to watch the alternative minimum tax again. So it may not be deductible for alternative minimum tax yeah. as so, a miscellaneous itemized deduction. But if you've got a large enough loss, maybe it is of use to you. So it's worthwhile going to see your accountant or yeah. tax preparer yeah. so you need to, to check some, on that. need to do some figuring. Yeah. To, okay. to take that loss, you would have to actually liquidate and close out the existing 529 plan. Um, but then you take the money and you just open a new 529 plan and put it into that. Okay. Let's talk about financial aid for a moment. Are there some changes there, too, that you'd like to... Talk there have been, it. yes, there have been changes. Uh, uh, President Obama has made some changes actually as part of that Health Care Act mm. uh, from earlier this year. Um, well, the, I think the change that was most publicized was uh, getting some of the banks out of the direct student loans, the Stafford loans. Okay. So they're all direct now from the government. Mm -hmm. So a company like Sally May that used to be big in that business right. uh, is now reduced to looking after the old loans and servicing some of the new government loans, but the money itself now comes from the government. And what, they, what, uh, what the government did was to take the money it saved that it was paying to banks and so on and, and commission and fees and putting that towards more Pell Grant money. Hopefully uh, that's all going to work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another thing uh, though that's, um, that's, that's coming along here is some changes to the FAFSA, which is the the, the free application for student aid, right. um, the main need-based federal uh, aid. Uh, when, you, when you think about it, the, the form asks for your income information. And so that leaves a family you know, filling out the FAFSA, then submitting its taxes, and then changing the FAFSA in order to agree with, with the taxes. And then the schools come along after that and say, we want to verify these numbers. Please send us a copy of your tax return. A lot of you know, yeah. bureaucratic work there. Yes. Um, so to replace that, the idea is that basically the Department of Education and the IRS will talk to each other. In other words, the numbers on your tax return go straight to the Department of Education. Oh, boy. They're not, that, that, that system isn't quite working yet, but new for this, this coming year on the next FAFSA, if you look carefully at it, where you come to sign it at the end, um, what you're signing, uh, you're actually signing, you're actually authorizing the Department of Education to go to the IRS for your, your tax numbers. Okay, now, you brought up FAFSA, so timing, I think, here is an important thing, particularly as, uh, for the time when this is going to be shown, which I think is going to be either late December or in January, when should you submit that FAFSA form for the best time uh, for you to get it in? Um, earlier the better, so really. Isn't it March 1st is like a drop-dead date on Yes, there's a, a drop-dead date for Californians at least would be actually March 2nd. Okay. Uh, which is after which you would not qualify for state aid. Okay. Uh, so it's not as, as much a date that's important to the FAFSA as it, must, as it is towards the, the state aid, the Cal Grant. Um, but, you know, we, we were talking 
uh, in the previous discussion about how admissions offices are under pressure. So the more work they can do earlier in the season, the more they would appreciate that. Now, related to this also, this is one time when I would think that you don't want to have your tax return on extension. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. If, so, if you want that aid. Yeah, to get the aid, you want to get your tax return actually submitted rather early. Mm -hmm. If you can, I would think by the end of February. Uh, I know your, your accountant would, would <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah, it's hard because the documents sometimes don't come in. Uh, so well, but again, uh, what I would suggest related to this whole thing, again, we're talking about uh, federal financial aid processing and so forth, uh, which is sort of the source document for everything, mm -hmm. uh, that you want to get your tax returns done early on these years. And I had to do that when I had my kids going to school. It's hard for an accountant to get their tax <laughs> return done by March 1st. Okay, well, I think um, actually, we're, we're getting a little short on time, so maybe you can maybe share some words of wisdom and talk a little bit about how you help people in this process. Um, yes, uh, you know, my goal is first education because a lot of families come to me really not understanding this process, especially if it's you know the, f the first time through, first first child through. Um, so I. After educating them about the process, I will help them with things like the financial aid applications and help them with budgeting. I mean, to me, that's one of the critical things so that they understand how much they can spend. It's like, uh, my analogy is like buying a car. Mm -hmm. um, everybody would like a shiny black Mercedes, but when we go out car shopping, typically we have some number in mind that we're going to spend and end up with a car that meets that expense. When you look at college, it's like buying a shiny new car every year. It's that expensive. So it makes a lot of sense to understand how much it's going to cost at the beginning and make sure you're set up to actually pay that, that sum. Yeah. Okay, David. I think we've about um, used up our time here. Um, I appreciate the service that you're giving to people and uh, the information that you shared with us here today. And um, folks, the, the area of a college ed education, this is, it's like one of the th <laughs> three biggest expenses you're going to have in your life. There's your house and there's your, <laughs> you know, your car and his college education. And then maybe also, of course, providing for your retirement, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. is a big and thing. So anyway. Uh, so uh, getting the help of a financial planner in that process can be a big help uh, and a worthwhile investment. So with that, um, I hope that you'll think about these things and that you found this valuable. And I'll see you next time on Financial Insider Weekly.